Labour MP and, of course, uh, previous Remain supporter Stephen Kinnock and the Leave supporter and Conservative MP Bernard Jenkins. Welcome to you both. Uh, Stephen Kinnock, are you going to vote for chaos tonight? It's nothing to do with chaos. It's to do with parliamentary sovereignty. I mean, whatever the Brexit vote was about, it surely wasn't about degrading our constitutional values, degrading the role of Parliament. I thought it was about taking back control and building the sovereignty and power of uh, the mother of all democracies. And this bill actually is a silent coup d'etat. It's about the executive making a massive power grab, undermining the role of parliament and shifting to rule by decree. And in my view, that is not delivering the will of the people. Well, you always expect from oppositions a certain amount of professional outrage, and we're getting that, and from uh, people who are very disappointed we're leaving the European Union. Mm. And this is to be expected. And this, there's a perfectly legitimate debate about scrutiny. But this is about scrutiny, not sovereignty. The, the constitutional outrage was the way the European Union made laws without anything touching the ground in this kingdom, let alone in Parliament. Yeah, but you want to make it better. Yes, of course. This is going to be much better. From your perspective... This is much better because and, every... And, and, and the problem is that... The argument is, is that the way in which the government is doing this is not giving Parliament back any power, it's the executive taking it all. Well, it's not, it is giving Parliament back power because every single legal instrument will be blockable by Parliament. So they're not decrees like that came down from Europe. Every single one. The question is how we scrutinise them. And I think there's a perfectly legitimate debate, Stephen, that we talk about how we improve the scrutiny of statutory instruments generally, particularly these instruments we call Henry VIII clauses that amend primary statute. But your government put through constitutional legislation with Henry VIII clauses in them, like the devolution statutes that are, stay on the statute book today. The government has the power to amend primary statute by a secondary instrument. But so let's have this discussion about how to make this... Um, perhaps yeah, but more I, tasteful, I but it isn't the constitutional outrage you pretend it to be. I just don't think that historical analogy holds, because what we're talking about here is uh, unravelling 40 years of uh, We're not unravelling anything, we're keeping it the European same. Union. But, yeah, I mean, do you... And <laughs> so you, you can, if, you, if you grant powers to ministers to simply decide whether yeah. or not it's appropriate they to won't use have that power. a they Henry VIII power, then you, you, you know, you've got to have that built into the bill that we can't do that. So we're saying we don't have well, a problem with a bill in principle, but as things stand, it's well, not fit you're for purpose. It in principle. Well, well, but, well and, that, that's the Jeremy Corbyn's position. Because the government has refused to deal with us on any of the amendments that we're proposing. But in principle, you accept, uh, A, that Britain is leaving the European Union, and yes. be that if we do so as a legislator, we need to incorporate this law into, in, into British law. Yes, absolutely. But as a legislator, so, I want to be able to go to Parliament and exercise the powers that the people of my constituency yeah. vested in me to scrutinise the executive. And this bill will neuter Parliament and it but, will turn us from legislators into commentators. But defeating it tonight would actually be a way of delaying the whole process, wouldn't it? Of, of, uh, you know, perhaps trying to stay in the EU. No, because I think what we're saying is we have a, we'd have a reasoned amendment which says we can't support the bill in its present form, accept our reasoned amendment, open up to the amendments that we need to see, and then, of course, the bill goes through. But it needs uh, presumed competence for the devolved administrations. It needs institutional parity where we don't have British institutions that can do what EU institutions currently do. We need an impact clause to make sure that we protect our rights, and we need also proper scrutiny. I would recommend uh, people look at the Hansard Society's report on a sift and scrutiny committee that makes sure that we get this right because it's about our democracy. And I get the impression you are quite sympathetic to a lot of that. Yeah, I think the Hansard Society report uh, is very good, but of course the Hansard Society report isn't about amending the bill at all. It's about reforming our procedures in the House of Commons mm. and in the House of Lords. Mm. And uh, to that extent, I think there's a dialogue. Look, Stephen, but, I, I think... Mean, well, do you well, think I mean, the has made a mess of it, though? I mean, you're... No, I think the opposition's making a mess of it because I think the government is up for a conversation about this if people are acting in good faith. But if the Labour opposition are voting against the principle of the bill, because that's what second reading debate is about, I think it, it's difficult for us to engage in a conversation about this 
when we can't have confidence that they actually support the principle of the process. But we have a reasoned amendment which mm. sets out our reservations yes, about the bill. Be voting if those the reservations reading. were taken on board by the government mm. in this so-called spirit of democratic okay, let me ask engagement, you a question. If, then if the reasoned amendment is defeated, will you then vote for the second reading of the bill? No, because the reasoned amendment sets they out are. clearly what we need to see yeah. in the bill they to are. make it fit for purpose. Because I can't vote, vote for a bill, the bill that's not fit for purpose. But there is it's about a, democratic control. There is a division amongst uh, Labour pro-Europeans, because, for example, Caroline Flint, the former Europe minister, says that in the end she will vote for the second reading because you have to accept the principle behind it. Well, I mean, there's a difference of opinion there because my view is, and I think the view of the vast majority of the Parliamentary Labour Party, that we accept the need to transpose EU legislation into the British, into, onto the British statute book. That's not in question. What is in well, that's question what the about, is though. the bill as it currently stands isn't doing that. It's actually a power grab. It is uh, neutering Parliament, giving far too much power to the executive. And in my view, that's not delivering on the will of the British people. The people that voted to leave the European Union uh, in the referendum voted to enhance the sovereignty and power and strength of the British Parliament. And this bill will do none of those things. Well, I'm so glad you're in favour of that now, because you weren't before. I've always been in favour um, of it. Um, I've always been the, in favour of it. In, you know, in my view, membership got, of the European we, Union actually okay, enhances that. I gave you a free run. But, um, uh, Probably we've got people like Tony Blair saying, uh, paradoxically, he says, uh, we've got to accept the referendum result in order to be able to change it. That's what he said. I mean, you know, that is an absolute classic of Tony Blair saying both things out of both sides of his mouth at the same time, which are completely... But, but presumably uh, I mean, saying things about... It means about, he doesn't I mean, accept it. No, but saying things about limiting immigration, which you presumably... Well, yes, but the point is, if you accept the referendum result, that doesn't mean you're trying to change it, and he is trying to change it. And, you know, if, if the Labour Party wants to engage in good faith with the government on this, Stop sending all these signals that actually well, you don't accept the referendum. Well, well, what did you make of uh, Tony Blair's intervention? T Tony can speak for himself. I voted to trigger Article 3. I, I campaigned yeah. passionately for Remain. Uh, and, you know, th th I make no secret of that, and I'm proud of the fact that I did so. But I absolutely accept the referendum result. I voted to trigger mm. Article 50. This is not about whether we leave the European Union. It's how we leave it. Mm. And we have to do it. What a, what a terrible irony it would be if people voted to enhance the strength of our parliament mm. and the sovereignty of our parliament, and then through Brexit we get the opposite result. No, that's not going to happen. I mean, this could end up being the biggest own goal the Conservatives have ever scored, because, as we all know, you're not terribly popular in the opinion polls at the moment. And you'd be handing all these Henry VIII powers to uh, King, King Corbyn the first. Well, actually, all these Henry VIII <laughs> powers are temporary. Um, and um, I hear what you're saying. There isn't going to be an early general election. I think the, the vote tonight yeah. uh, will demonstrate that, actually, um, yeah. Theresa's authority uh, yeah. is more extensive than people think. But, I mean, the majority is pretty flimsy, isn't it? And the latest analysis, for example, says that even the deal with the DUP may face a parliamentary vote. Now, is that going to get through? Um, when you say it may face a parliamentary vote, the DUP will support the government on any issue of confidence. Um, I don't understand They've the had their billion making. pounds to make sure that that happens. Well, gonna be, when we leave the Every... EU, there's going to be lots of money for everybody yeah. because uh, we won't be uh, making yeah, our the 350 no million for the NHS as well. Uh, yeah. yeah. But, I mean, I mean, the £1 billion deal or the £10 million deal, I mean, there's going to be a vote on that, apparently. Um, I suspect the DUP will vote for that. But, I mean, the DUP have got actually quite a legitimate case to make for the long reconstruction necessary in Northern Ireland, the transition through the Brexit process, and other parts of the United Kingdom... the magic money tree. Other parts of the United Kingdom also deserve extra funding. They get extra funding. Uh, Wales is yeah. a bit short but changed, but hopefully we will be able to deal with this. This is where it all gets so complicated because... It's uh, not very complicated. Well, you know, what's happened in the courts today, and this is uh, breaking news, is uh, a ruling uh, that the uh, it actually contravenes the payment uh, to the DUP, uh, contravenes the Bribery Act and the Good Friday Act, Good well, Friday Agreement. Uh, I, haven't, I haven't seen that and I don't know anything about it. So uh, you caught me well, blindsided. I, I wasn't. But that—that is—that is, that <laughs> yeah. is uh, that's big. I, if that yeah. is the case, then I think uh, Theresa May has got serious questions. But this is—I mean, I mean, if you take that example, it in a sense shows that perhaps you shouldn't get quite so agitated about this because there are the courts, there are uh, procedures uh, away from the chamber which could actually uh, hold back a government uh, from being able to act as uh, Henry VIII did.
I, I can't imagine anything less, uh, anything more important than this simple fact, which is the laws that govern our country are made by Parliament, Quite not right. by the executive. Exactly. And this bill actually hands a massive amount of power, subjective, uh, random decisions yeah. can be made, I mean, and that leads to bad legislation and bad decision making. It's, so it's all quite technical. I mean, can well. you give an example of something you think might happen if this bill goes through unamended? So, on institutional parity, let's take, for example, aviation. As things stand, uh, the regulation of aviation across the European Union is Europeanized. There is a, a, a European agency, and you uh, have to, any member state has to demonstrate that its aviation rules and regulations comply with that agency. What will happen when we come out of that agency, when we leave the European Union, we don't have a British agency to replace that capability. Just, so let, let's just be absolutely clear that we need institutional parity. Where there isn't a British agency that can fulfill the role that's currently fulfilled by a European agency, we're going to have a huge governance gap unless we have a clause in this bill which ensures that we don't legislate on that basis until we have institutional parity. That's just one example. Okay. But um, actually, this is not a very complicated problem. The Civil Aviation Authority still exists. It used to govern aviation safety in the United Kingdom. The European Aviation Safety Agency is quite a new institution. Going back to what we had is not complicated. And there is an example. We can debate how that legislation should be dealt with, but the legislation to transfer those powers back to the Civil Aviation, aviation Authority and restore what it used to be should be quite simple. But well, we do have a... Fine, but let's have the safeguards yeah. in this bill to make sure I that we, we don't jump off that. a cliff I mean, edge. I, I, well, we I, do have a big gap, talk about in that. terms of regulatory agencies, uh, that we handed over yes, those past yes. year. And, and it's going to cost a lot of money to, to re-establish those regulations. Well, agencies. at the moment, we pay far more and we pay other people's contributions to keep the a European agencies going. It will be far cheaper and more accountable to run our own agencies. It'll be much more advantageous. And we'll get our seat at the international table of, for the international organisations where we're currently represented by the EU on aviation safety, on trade, on food safety, on all these things that we're excluded from these bodies at the moment internationally. So we have far more influence. Just uh, to clarify what we're hearing early on about the ruling in the courts that's going on as uh, we speak, they've decided the Treasury uh, Secretary has accepted there will now be a vote on this one billion uh, deal with the DUP because otherwise uh, it uh, could have been in contravention of uh, uh, the Good Friday Agreement and those acts. Well, uh, I'm all for uh, Parliament voting on significant m amounts of money. Yeah. Um, and it's one of the advantages of leaving the European Union is we've had no control over the amount of money we give to the European Union whatsoever yeah. uh, ever since we joined, it, why, except why, by Margaret Thatcher having has, a huge row about you know, it. If we go back to the Gina Miller case, mm -hmm. consistently, why has Mrs May, uh, you say you think there's growing support for her, why has she avoided scrutiny whenever she can and come up well, with uh, phrases um, like Brexit? The corporate? All the conventional legal advice about the Gina Miller case was that it was, a very no it was advancing some very novel constitutional doctrines. The fact that our new and well, rather... Well, vote on Article 50 wasn't well, that Well, just a novel. minute. I was going to finish the point. The fact our, our new and rather innovative Supreme Court decided to adopt those doctrines came as a big surprise to a lot of the legal establishment. And, in fact, the, um, the appeal court uh, had its uh, own judgment significantly limited and watered down the implications of it. I think it was actually helpful that we voted on the article. Yeah, but that, that's not the answer to my question, is why Mrs May has well, gone She was gone acting down on legal the... advice. And, and, well, the, 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 and many, many times Labour governments have acted on legal advice and found that, found that their legal advice is wanting. I mean, this is... The, Mil the, the Miller case was a slam dunk because our membership of the European Union confers rights on British citizens and anything which involves the removal of those rights must be subject to a vote in Parliament. It never so that applied was, to an it, they, they never had, The government never had a chance of winning that case. No, no, that that's case. not true at all. And, and what okay. it reflects is a pattern of behaviour from Number 10 Downing Street, which is about control freakery. It's about this is ridiculous. Uh, the terror of being open to the scrutiny that our democracy no, requires. It's about neutering Parliament. This is what opposition is because, <laughs> because Whitehall is creaking under the strain of Brexit and there is a serious issue now about our national interest. I wish that the Prime Nobody's Minister would change the behaviour and this repeal bill could be an excellent opportunity to do so. OK, we will see you in the small hours. What happens? <laughs> yes, it's going to be a long night.